Hi, and welcome to Power of 10, a podcast about design operating at many levels, zooming out from thoughtful detail through to organizational transformation and onto changes in society and the world. My name is Andy Pollain. I'm a service design and innovation consultant, coach, trainer, and writer. My guest today is Udaya Kumar Padmanapan, a design leader, practitioner, coach, entrepreneur who has led design teams across the globe for over 23 years. He currently leads design delivery and DesOps at Designit, ASEAN and Sark. Udaya, welcome to Power of 10. Hey, thanks, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. So my first question is ASEAN and Sark. Tell us what those acronyms mean. So we can just get that one out of the way. Okay. ASEAN is basically an association of Southeast Asian countries, I guess, nations. And uh, a subset of ASEAN is basically SARC. So basically six, right. five or six countries. I may get my geography wrong. Please bear with me. But I think it's an association of countries that are not east, but are just south. So so net net, basically you start from India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan, and five, six countries, and then ASEAN. So that's that's SARC. So it's a subset right. of ASEAN, yeah. Yeah. And so you're you're speaking to me from India at the moment. Whereabouts are you? I am based out of Bangalore currently. Right. So here's the thing. You studied mathematics. So what was your journey as statistics and comp sci? You're a, you're a quant, right? So how did you end up in design? Did you okay. just study the wrong thing? Because that's what, <laughs> you know, that's what the, you were expected to do? Or what, what, how did, I'm really interested about people who have those kind of windy journeys. So how did you go from that? What was the first thing that made you think, oh, you know, that design thing? And then, you know, get to where you are now, leading design teams. Yeah, I think I, what, I, what I'm going to say might sound like a canned story because I have heard the same things being played back to me in all my interviews and all my networking things when I talk to people, but my my, my, my story is based on a true story. <laughs> so I've been told that from a very young age, I, was, I had a lot of artistic inclination. Maybe it runs in my family. But yeah, I mean, I'm not talking about genetic predisposition or anything, but I think I was gifted. That's what my parents say. And uh, I started sketching and doodling and doing a lot of stuff, uh, self-learned. And I was super lucky to have parents who never flinched. They catered to all my wins and fancies uh, back in the day. Yeah, you know, even getting, you know, art material was tough. Uh, right, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so I think I was good at art. I think I transitioned from art to design even without knowing it. So I would be lying if I say that, you know, I was an accidental designer. No, I was always on the artistic side of things. I have won every single competition that I used to participate in right through school and college. And I used to sketch and paint and do a lot of stuff. I wish I can do that again, but I don't find time or... But but yeah, I think I, I seamlessly transitioned into design uh, because I was doing uh, creative stuff. And uh, yeah, though I was very good at programming, I didn't I didn't enjoy programming during my grad. So you know, it was one of my major subjects. I used to just do it because you got to write your exams, you have to pass your discourse and good grades. But apart from that, programming never interested me. You know, I did not want to spend the rest of my life sitting and you know coding. Uh, on a black screen or a green screen, to be honest. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think that that's that was that. And, uh, but I still wanted to be in, in, in software and IT. My generation was the cusp where India was like, zoo, you know, booming with IT and a lot of, you know. Yeah. So I think it was, maybe it just happened. So <laughs> that that is how I got into design. And it's been, yeah, 23 years and I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, because it, it is slightly the cliche, right? Obviously, of kind of, like you said, around that time, India was kind of booming. Everyone's kind of moving into software engineering and all that sort of stuff. So, I had kind of, it's also a cultural cliche of, you know, parents kind of saying, oh, come on, you should do this uh, <laughs> for a living. And so, but you still studied quant. And so, was that a kind of anomaly then? So, what, how, I mean, I, well, I guess I'm saying it because if it was me and and just hearing you talk about, you know, I used to sketch and doodle and stuff. And my, you know, my father was a designer and turned an artist. So mm -hmm. it was always almost the opposite thing. It was almost always there. Yes. What made you then, I, I don't think I could have stuck through three years of doing stats and, and mathematics. I couldn't, I couldn't have done it anyway because I'm not good enough. So <laughs> what was going on there? Interesting question. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think even without realizing, I think that a very early age, uh, maybe that's because I grew up in such a scenario where you were actually asked to make decisions on your own. One of the reasons I probably uh, took quant is not because, uh, you know, I like quant or something. My parents 
you know, just let it up to me. You want to do engineering, you do it. You want to do medicine, you. In fact, I actually topped. I actually topped. Uh, you know, all the entrance exams in India. It's a highly competitive sphere, and I actually literally mm-hmm. made it to every everything. But I didn't want to study four years and do engineering because my family trust me. Eighty uh, percent of my family, as I speak, are engineers or ex-engineers. <laughs> <laughs> the, cliche, the cliche is not a cliche. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think in India, you either are a doctor or an engineer, uh, or or probably into finance. So I, I think maybe I, I, I grew up in a scenario and, and, and my dad was a hardcore financial uh, person and he was an economist having spent this time with right. you know, World Bank and all of that. So I didn't want to mm. do what my dad wanted to do <laughs> at the same good, time. I didn't good. want to do it. Also a good thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so long story short, I think it just happened. It just happened that uh, I had, uh, because you're, you're studying computer science, you have access to the labs and you, you, know, you could spend almost an entire day in the lab and you have access to software and all that. So I just stumbled onto the creative side of things, like you know, Photoshop, Ellie, uh, Corel at its early days. I think I'm probably yeah. one of the re- relics who used to work on uh, Photoshop, Ellie on a monochrome monitor. I keep telling this to no, people. I've, and like, <laughs> I, I've been there too. Yeah, I started on Photoshop too, and wow. I even might have been one before on a Mac LC2 and a uh, and bla- in black and white. We had, well, no, we had color monitors, but we had to do everything in black and white because we were saving it onto floppy disks and, and, and color <laughs> images were too uh, were too and, big, right? Yeah, I can I can relate. I come from that, <laughs> so you know how it was. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I tell you what, I have an old laptop because I, um, you know, I, a lot of you probably found too a lot of the work you made back in those days you can't view anymore. So I have an old laptop um, running Mac OS eight, I think, to, <laughs> to still do that. And I, I, uh, it had Photoshop. I opened it up ages ago, actually, it was a couple of years ago for a kind of reunion thing, mm-hmm. and it had Photoshop two point six on it. And of course, it's got that kind of eight bit interface, it just very yes. sort of black and white. It was really snappy. I have to say, I was quite impressed because the coders back then they really had to be very very lean with their code and the assets and everything and it everything was actually felt quite fast there was no sort of animations and drop shadows and stuff the only thing was as soon as you went to open another app so i opened (laughs) up um eudora i don't know if you remember the mail app eudora yes and then of course it says oh you you can't open this app because you need to make some memory so you have to quit photoshop and stuff but that in itself was quite good too for sort of forcing a non-multitasking workflow that if you were in photoshop and you kind of felt like oh i just checked my email you had to quit <laughs> photoshop open up your email so it was kind of that bit of friction where you went yeah no i'll just carry on doing this for the moment and i'll check my email later absolutely yes <laughs> yeah so happy days so yeah, listen back then as well the well, and it was interesting that there's a pathway that's happened, right? Because at the beginning, and I noticed you'd also done some sort of multimedia, and I used to teach multimedia authoring and stuff. And, and back then, the sort of promise of it all was you can do everything, right? You do the audio, you do the visuals, you, you code it, you script it, and all of that sort of stuff. And then it kind of split off where, you know, development and, you know, and front-end development and design, and I know there's the whole should designers code thing, but they kind of split off quite a lot and then sort of came back together again in the in the whole sort of CSS, HTML, you know, designer should code. And now things have become so complex, particularly with sort of mobile, that it's kind of split back out again. Yes. Have you found that your, you know, being versed in both worlds has been useful for you as a, as a design leader? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think that, is, that was one of the after effects that I never realized that I had it inherently in me. Uh, there's always this d- divide between, you know, right brain, left brain. We've been through all this uh, story, you know, right? Designers and engineers and all of that. Yeah, maybe sure. I, I sat, maybe I, I think my, my acads and my, you know, what I do for a career actually sat very comfortably right next to one another. Uh, so did that help me? I mean, I hate to use the word empathy because of late that word also has been like misused <laughs> to the core. Yeah, but, I, yeah, but, sure. but I think, yeah, I think what helped, helped me maybe, maybe subconsciously or otherwise that, you know, okay, I, I can, I can paint the whole town red, but I do know the limitations of the front end technology being used or, you know, like, like you said, back in the day, even before uh, JS became a thing, we had DHT and you, you, if you could blink text, I mean, you were the greatest designer on the planet types, but I think having, having worked with large scale engineering teams, I was always part and parcel of product companies and platform companies where design, as we know today, was not designed those days, right? You, you, were, you were part of a larger engineering team or a product. And I, I, have yeah, gone, yeah. I have been a product manager more than a designer at, during one stage of my career. So I think it definitely helps to know the limitations uh, of, of the technology uh, that you're designing for. Uh, and sometimes it also helps you in terms of doing diligence. Uh, I'm not saying 
all the engineers do this, but more often than not, you can you can find development teams coming back with excuses, a genuine or otherwise, stating that this can't happen, <laughs> that can't happen. I mean, this I, is I'm impossible. Sure. <laughs> yes, uh, I think now they're sober. All thanks to Google, everything is mm. available at a tap. So people people mask their uh, excuses, but it helps. It helps, and I think. I think it, it is always good to know at least something functional, you know, functionally. Rather, you don't need to sit in code. You don't need to be a hack. But if you understand what the other person is doing, I think it helps. I mean, it, it has mm. been one of my sweet spots, if you will, because I have a lot of friends and peers who actually just went to design schools and just the design. They're also doing better, good. But I think they, they cringe when it comes to design handoffs. It's still a debate in their life, in their, in their teams and all that. But I think I got bailed out of that because I... I understand that. And I also kept myself abreast of what's happening. I mean, with every technology yeah. changing every six months, you have to stay updated as well. So, Yeah. It's tiring, that too, though, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> but that sort of brings us, the, the handoffs thing brings us nicely onto design ops, actually, I guess, and design delivery, because it's, you know, it's, that's a really crucial part of it. So how do you practice design ops at design it? What's, you know, what's kind of fundamental to the way you think about it and how you set it up? I think there's, there's been like, you know, there's been a lot of uh, talk about DevOps and a lot of uh, you know Maloof. Dave, 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 Dave talks a lot about it, and there's a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, sure. uh, so in, in my mind, I think it was a natural progression. I started off as a visual design guy. I moved to inter- interaction design, and then moved up to the leadership chain. Did stuff. Did my own companies. Then you know, basically, what what do you do next in design, right? So I think it was a natural progression for me. I generally tell. Uh, people when they ask what is DevOps, now they're talking about DevOps. Basically, it's like add an ops to everything, and <laughs> we are in that <laughs> yeah. situation. Yeah. So yeah. I generally tell people so add that, experience to everything as well, right? Yes, yes. So I, I, I tell people that DevOps, in simple a layman's term, is basically you enable and you facilitate designers to do what do, what they do best to solve problems, business problems. And how do you do that? There's a plethora of things, right? I mean, you figure out the right person for the right, uh, uh, you know, activity. You and you, you ensure that you know they get what they need to get at the right time, right place, and you know, create a conducive environment for them to uh, deliver stuff. Uh, sit at the intersection of you know what your client wants, what the technology says. Uh, you can do and you can't do. Also, I might differ from the other desktop, uh, you know, fellow tribesmen in the sense that I I think. It's not just facilitating them and you know running running a well-oiled engine and winning awards and doing stuff, but also showing the way ahead. At least showing them a direction that designers can actually pick up. I think uh, more so in India. I think that's that's completely a miss. I mean, everybody thinks that I can join a company, I can join one of these you know heavily funded mm-hmm. startups, unicorns. Uh, yeah, people become uh, vice presidents of design with six years of experience. Nothing, nothing wrong in it, but <laughs> I think people lose track of what they need to do at certain point in time. So I think one of the most fundamental things, I think my role also, uh, the role that I play in design at and I think I'm doing a good job at it is, you know, identify certain amazing skills that people bring to the table, mentor them and ensure that they sharpen their knives and probably, you know, go, I hate to talk about, you know, T-shaped and I-shaped, but basically help them uh, experience uh, some certain things, practice certain things, and figure out what is it that they want to do next. Because more often than not, uh, a lot of companies don't bring that to the table. So I think it's a mix of getting work uh, delivered, getting them engaged, ensuring that they do a lot of stuff, and also giving showing them the way forward. So I don't know if it answered uh, <laughs> your question, but I think that's the kind yeah. of DevOps uh, lens that I uh, see my world through, and I think I've been I've been successful so far. So, so I mean, you touched on the Indian scene, and um, you know, most of the well, a lot of the voices we we hear on you know on podcasts and you know online and everywhere else is from America and Europe, and you know, when I was in Australia, obviously in Australia too. Mm-hmm. You know, you've also worked in different parts of the world, and you've got this role that covers pretty good chunk of you know the ASEAN and SARC is probably like a, <laughs> a third of the land mass I should imagine of, of the world so you know what have you experienced that's kind of different in India and what's I mean India is also a massive place right so it, is there a sense of a kind of Indian design scene or an Indian way of doing things is there a sense that client culture in India is very different from some other places in the world I'd be really interested to to hear your thoughts about that and your experiences 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Inter- interesting question. Uh, the, the overwhelming answer to all of the things that you asked is actually yes. It's slightly different. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> so I think, I think significant progressions in design basically has been you know, embraced from the West. Whether we like it or not, yeah. I think I think there's always this developed uh, economies and developing economies and all of that. Yeah, yeah. That's that's yeah. Economics also plays a role. Economics yeah. strata plays a role. But I think India, I keep telling this uh, very very often, and, and we are we are so diverse and to, so you know we are so diverse that probably we are a different country uh, every two hundred kilometers, right? <laughs> so we have yeah. like a thousand, uh, if not a- any less or any more official languages, dialects, uh, and languages. Uh, we have different cultures, different food, different things. And uh, I think what bonds us is this Indianness, but at the same time, we are very diverse. Uh, some things can be lifted and shifted. Uh, like there's only a certain way you can log in and log out, right? And that can't, you can't have an Indian way of logging in and log out. I, I, know, I know friends and colleagues uh, in the voice interface domain as, as we speak are trying to experiment with that also because India is an amazing mix. You have some of the best, yeah. uh, uh, best brain power. At the same time, you have one of the largest probably uh, we're coming. We are doing. We were doing good than what we were before. Uh, when it comes to literacy, we are still not there. We could be much better, and then that brings in a lot of uh, opportunity spaces, if not problem areas. So I think we follow a lot of things that the West inculcates because it has been tested. It has. It 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 works. We adopt and adapt, but some of the things get Indianized. Yeah. I mean, there are like multiple, uh, you know. Uh, incidences in my life in my professional life like healthcare right i mean we always say that if something works mm. then, but yeah i was personally involved in a couple of uh, projects where we actually went with certain premonitions and assumptions that okay uh, this is what needs to happen because it works in the westernized world and you guys have one of the best uh, medical fraternity in the world and government supports and all that but when we went to the field it turned out it was completely different so one of the programs that i was part of was you know basically to and uh, so, like I said, India is like a, such a large country with so much of population. Yeah. We have, we have, uh, we have some healthcare people. We, we have health. There are people who are, uh, you know, on the on on the ground, and these these are people. These are basically people with uh, what? Maybe maybe they would have passed their tenth grade or twelfth grade, uh, and then they get some training, and they're like midwives, uh, and and they basically act as the interim connect between an actual physician and and people. Uh, in, in the hinterlands of India, right? Urban, right. urban tier one, tier two cities are great, but but yeah. So one of the things was India is actually known for non-communicable diseases, right? I mean, we are probably yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, cancer and hypertension and things like that are like, I mean, they rule the roost. And unfortunately, in India, mm-hmm. because because we are a developing country, things are changing now. But though, but I think uh, yeah, addressing that, identifying that was always a problem. So one of the largest enterprises in the world actually came up with this, uh, you know, uh, program to actually help the medical fraternity and the Indian government to actually, you know, make a change and change. Yes, they have done. I mean, it's taken significant amount of blood, sweat and tears, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so some of, some of the, you know, research principles that we thought that we could apply lift and shift did not happen. For example, one of the things that uh, we went into the field uh, saying is maybe maybe depending on somebody's literacy level, maybe they may not be able to use a tablet. Or if they use a tablet, maybe it has to be visceral. It has to be more visual. They may not read. Hmm. But when, hmm. when we went went to the field, I think a lot of interesting anecdotes came. I think we, we, we actually changed the look and look and feel and an experience of an entire long journey from, you know, point, tap, click, write in, in local languages to simply like a pictogram. They basically have right. to... So, in retrospect, maybe maybe it was the healthcare, uh, you know, equivalent of Tinder. Basically, the, the <laughs> okay. health, yeah. The, so basically, the healthcare professional who was on the ground. So these are called accredited, you know, accredited social health activists, or we call it ASHA in India. ASHA means hope. It's way of hope types, so, right? Ah, yeah, so, okay. And uh, these are auxiliary, you know, nurses and midwives. Field testing told us that uh, they could actually do a fantastic. Uh, job at it and you know task completion ratios and they could actually go to a village and each one of them was responsible for about 5000 people and they were they were custodians of the health and you know well-being of 5000 people and uh, we figured out that they could just do a swipe top you know northeast southwest uh, from an interface standpoint and we actually reduced data input by 90% so in in retrospect yeah i mean things that work outside may not necessarily work in india but you you have to have that 
groundedness to say why not this and why that so that is one uh, you know you know how uh, cash on delivery has been there in the developed world for quite a while and people generally don't prefer that but india became the hotbed of cash on delivery because our culture is we only pay after we get the tangible as we speak <laughs> things are changing but i think i think e-commerce like flipkart i'm sure you would have heard about flipkart it's it's a multi billion dollar company and india is the hotbed of e-commerce not because of, just because of the consumption model or the consumers but also because of very subtle nuances like cash on delivery people still use uh, you know electronic wallets and pay uh, through cards but even today a significant amount of transactions in india happen through cash on delivery so nobody would have actually you know taken a 10 dollar bet that you know what worked in europe or australasia uh, you know developed side will work in india so there are funny anecdotes in india and you have to customize so that's 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 it's it's slightly different and uh, yeah people need to people need to identify that it's different it's it's okay to get what do you say it's okay to go through what's happening in the developed world and see i mean don't reinvent the wheel anyways if it works it works but if it doesn't work you need to you need to have the propensity to step out and see how can you tweak that so that it works in a specific context whether it's uh, yeah. geo geophysical or cultural so india is an experimenter's delight for that matter I, mean, I tell that to people so yeah i want to come back to sort of some of the methods thing in a second actually actually but one of the things that sort of struck me in when talking about india you know it the, is the scale of it right and i think just i was talking about land mass before but you know there's that side of it but there's also it, it's what 1.3 billion i mean it's kind of neck and neck with china for the kind of size yes. of the population isn't it i think by 2040 or 2050 or 20 yeah i mean i mean i think another 10 years we will be the number one we will be the most populous uh, and in fact uh, the prediction is china will scale it down to sub billion so there'll be like 900 million but we'll be 1.4 we are 1.2 and counting now <laughs> that's where right, we are right. which i mean you think of the kind of size of the united states as this kind of big market and it's what the states like 320 30 million i think you know and so the the, the scale is enormous so as designers working on something even when you save a or you know help a small fraction of people it's still like a massive amount of people is there have you can you think of any examples where that's been the case where you've really has there been anything you've had the chance to work on that has a kind of national uh, or really kind of large scale outcome or impact and you know what are the concerns there or how do you kind of deal with that massive range so uh, yeah yeah great 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 question so I think e-commerce is like I said e-commerce is really really hot because consumption is really really hot in India be it be it uh, clothing be it accessories or be it food I think uh, like you said the sheer scale of uh, you know possibilities actually makes e-commerce thrive and uh, I've been yeah I've been part of uh, multiple gigs in the past so one of the most recent ones was in my past life I actually was part of an organization that actually launched India's first omni channel Uh, experiences for retail uh, they they were custodians of like 17 mm-hmm. international mm-hmm. brands a multi billion dollar company and uh, they moved from from a more I say from a lifestyle clothing and accessory company to a technology company so yeah we knew the market was great we knew the numbers are great all of that yeah. but i think as we move forward we found a lot of interesting stuff that irrespective of omni channel and multi channel some of the cultural nuances like it's okay for me to look at it digitally it's okay for me to scroll and swipe through my phone but i would like to go to a store i would like to go to a store and touch it and feel it and pick it context again depending on yeah, yeah. whether yeah so that is uh, but but we were we were able to run uh, a small experiment out of that as a parallel offering where we offered bespoke clothing and and and, and the uniqueness of this was yes somebody comes it's it is like a concierge service somebody comes to your place somebody takes your measurement it's all digitized and uh, you know you get you get your bespoke clothing uh, uh, to the to the dot probably delivered in like a, a couple of weeks time but 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 the market was very very scaled down in the sense the fabric that we were on offer was insanely expensive beyond 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 the affordability of an average indian if you, if you want to tell that so we were like yeah, yeah. okay let's see if if it works and amazingly there were people buying 
buying clothes and you know tuxedos and uh, bespoke clothing like nobody's business so i think i think the impact in terms of p and l p more p and o l was significant yeah, yeah. And, and we figured out that a small cohort of people could actually give you a lot of value if you actually identify them and i think that was that is one example i keep talking to people saying that you don't need to boil the ocean sometimes just find a small niche work for it work towards yeah. it and you you can but yeah it's it's a hit or miss then uh, healthcare i've seen a couple of uh, things in, in in india we are like maybe we are highly regulated at the same time we are also highly uh, not regulated you could just walk to your friendly neighborhood pharmacy pharmacist if you know them and actually take buy drugs without a prescription i mean uh, it's it's technically it's not allowed but i think it still happens people self medicate be it a headache or be it some chronic yeah, illness yeah, that yeah. so now of late there is a significant traction in terms of you know buy medicine online a uh, couple of companies are really doing good uh, i don't know if they will you know, break into the unicorn uh, benchmark or not but uh, yeah. ad- adoption is kind of uh, okay okay because again the user journey expects you to actually upload a prescription that in my mind will work for probably millennials probably for us probably if my mom or my dad had to do this they won't be doing this but yeah sometimes some of these startups basically say that we don't need to we don't want to deal with a certain class a cluster of people and uh, that can come back to bite you badly uh, under the lens you know under the ambit of coverage and social impact and all of that because yeah, india is very yeah. india is a very touchy feely country too so i have no qualms in that so yeah happens but this is where we run we run a lot of uh, we also we run a lot of mini experiments to find out uh what works and what doesn't work and in my mind having been an entrepreneur myself i think this that's super critical to have this mindset don't be married to your ideas and don't be you know so stuck to it if there's a better way to do it please go ahead and do it because that may that may mean you shutting your company without you know sp- you know earning a dollar or you becoming a multi yeah. million dollar company and is there the appetite for that because you know there's classically in in some parts of the world one of the places where i live um you know the there's a sort of real risk adversity you know and i want to know it actually works um before we're going to go ahead with this or where is this work before how do i know and all of that kind of stuff you know it's it's not just where i i think it's also <laughs> you know it's 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 common right so is there the appetite for you know let's do some experiments or is it just you know, let's just come up with the idea and get it out there and deliver it and but i want to know that it's certain before we do it i i think it's the latter everybody wants everybody wants to quickly i think i think entrepreneurship also is glamorized it's not just an india thing i think it's 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 glamorized across the globe uh, because for every yeah. 10 you know every 10 failures there's one unicorn but i think everybody wants to do it at least culturally i think as a country now we are okay allowing our friends kit and kin to actually take a deep dive into entrepreneurship but still we take very measured steps probably you know but i think this whole notion of let's fail fast let's do experiments actually is in play as i speak but the scale at which it can happen in india because of the sheer number of startups that we have hmm. and I'm, I'm, my city is considered i mean the city that i live in bangalore i was born and raised here so that's why i called it my city i think hmm. this place is one of the top 10 uh, you know startup cities on the planet for quite a while but but things could be better uh, because not everybody can talk to the top 10 vcs and raise capital not everybody can yeah, do it yeah. but conceptually more all of the entrepreneurs that i know of friends who are running firms friends who have been successful friends who are trying to do it mentors mentees all of them they understand the importance of it but are they doing it day in and day out unfortunately no for for yeah. obvi- obvious reasons so still massive scale though as well with those things you know oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with 1 yeah. 1% of the population is 13 million right it's yes. um, unbelievable it's kind of, yeah. um so you know talking about you know we we're talking about human centered design methods and a lot of the stuff that you know you've brought in from the west i guess or the developed countries you know some of those things don't always work in in other cultures you know so i'm um, one of the things i certainly learned spending and i don't want to kind of just lump asia in in this kind of like as it's, it's just one culture in one country and um it's more or less in in different countries in asia which is you know things about you know co-design workshops which tend to favor cultures where extroversion is a admired trait and where challenging hierarchy is fine and so on and so forth while there's other things about doing say field interviews contextual interviews where um you know i might go as a man in in you know germany and go and interview a woman in her home 
um, on my own, you know, and whereas in other cultures that just doesn't work at all. There's also other cultures where you're, there's this real sense of, no, there's a kind of inside and there's an outside and I'm not just going to let a stranger in and tell them about my, my life. So, I, I, you know, you've, you've done all of this. You've done a lot of UX, you've done research, you've done all these things and you've done it in different parts of the world. So what have you found you've had to modify? You mentioned you'd had to kind of change some things before. Yeah, so so at, at, at the outset, I think in the last 10, 12 years, India also has actually come of age, if you if you will. Maybe when I was, maybe when I was pre-teens yeah. and teens, I think there was always this closetedness that, you know, uh, research is, is not for us. Steps. People literally used to work out. But I think, I think it, so, so the beauty of research in India is this, right? Market research as a construct has been thriving for at least 20, 30 years now. Because again, as you yeah. said, you're a huge, huge market. You have a huge uh, consumable market for, you know, consumer goods. I mean, it's immense, tremendous, right? From the pulses that you buy to the, you know, uh, things that you use in a kitchen. Uh, so basically, this market research that's been happening, and there are quite a few agencies, uh, uh, you know, worth their gold, and some of them are legendary in India. So people are okay. People are aware of the fact that maybe there's a researcher, maybe Andy is coming from Germany. He's representing, I'm just making this up. Maybe he's coming from Bosch. Yeah, and they're, sure. trying to, they're trying to figure out... Uh, so, you know, in designing and testing a new filter coffee maker, right? I mean, India is big on coffee and filter coffee perfectly. Uh, and and uh, yeah, Andy comes and people are okay. They're very welcoming. They will let you in, in their house. They will definitely talk to you. You can you can do all of those in situ ethnographic studies. But but yeah, the the, the precursor part is, is is a little tough. You need to know people. You need to actually go and sell the construct that somebody is coming and you know somebody is going to do this research and all that. Whereas, whereas my experience uh, outside of India has been and has been pretty seamless, right? We 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 call up an agency and right. we say this is what we want. So in India, that, that things are changing. I know of at least one or two agencies which actually do this and they deliver the goods. Uh, but then again, uh, like I said, uh, you know, there's always this disparity between uh, cost and price value, right? More yeah, often than yeah. not, we all we we always want the maximum value at the least cost. As a as as Probably as, as it's, it's it's cultural uh, and not not anything else. But I think research, yes, you can get in, you can talk to people. But but yeah, some people uh, people that invite you over definitely are you know probably they, you'll you'll make you'll probably make one or two friends for life. Most recently, we did we did we did similar stuff uh, for a very large consumer uh, you know product company, and uh, yeah, I mean they let us in. We spoke to them. We figured out a lot of uh, stuff. And then there was another other similar research that we did to figure out uh, the propensity of Indians to consume a certain type of oil. Mm. Very, inter- very interesting uh, stuff that we got to know. And we learn a lot of adjacent things. But I think, I think the fact that, yeah, India is kind of a different country is absolutely right. But people are people. There, there's some horizontal that binds all of us together, <laughs> I think, uh, behaviorally. So people are mm-hmm. welcoming. People will tell you. But, but maybe the way cultural nuances of the way you ask certain things, the way you prompt certain yeah. things, that has to be orchestrated and choreographed. That's 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 the subtle but critical part. Otherwise, it on surface, it looks the same. So you'll have to fine tune that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's always the most dangerous thing. I even learned that going to Australia, actually. It took me a good, I reckon, about two years of living in Australia before I kind of really got the sense of, now, hang on, <laughs> there's a different set of cultural values and people have grown up in a different way it, it, you know when it looks the same or it seems the same but it's but it's on the surface but isn't that's where you kind of get tripped up absolutely hey so look you've you've talked about um you don't get good design for nothing now there's an obvious reading of that but what what do you mean by that i i think as we speak there are there are like yeah i mean i i i you know i take pride in the fact that i am part of an agency that's always considered as one of the top 10 strategic you know, design agencies yeah, on the yeah. planet. You've been, you, you spent a tremendous amount of time in a similar, uh, you know, agency yeah, yeah. in the past. But, but I think, I think there's always this disconnect between what you pay and what you want. Not from we practitioners or not, <laughs> not. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is. I think, I think a, a couple of my <laughs> economist yeah. friends, economist friends, actually say that you know what, the rest of the world has actually moved ahead. You know actually communicating the value to cost, you know, price to value and you know, value to cost and all of that. But I think design is still such an intangible that, yeah, maybe if, if I'm a Fortune 500 company or if I'm the top 100 companies in India, maybe, maybe you know, it's, it's part of my, uh, you know, agenda that I engage with one of the top X, N agencies mm-hmm. and I get stuff, stuff done because I think social proof also plays a, plays a significant role. Definitely, yeah. 
definitely Asian. Def- I, I think it, it's a worldwide phenomena, but I think back here it's more. You know, I got this done from the guy who designed uh, the latest thing for NASA. I mean, that that holds water. Than this is done by a guy who's from a tier two city, but he's solving a problem at scale. So sometimes it's luck, more often than yeah. not. But but I think this is this is a universal thing that I've noticed. It's not an Indian thing. I think irrespective of you being Fortune hundred, Fortune five hundred, I think people would want. Tell me who doesn't want an extra thing for bang for the buck? But in design, yeah. I think. And, and it, I think in design, the, the expectation is way too much. And I've started to realize, yeah, I also have gone through the churn and motion initially, you know, the exuberance of youth, those early days when you're a rock star designer and you were making a you know, <laughs> big name, you're like, yeah, these guys don't get it. But in fact, in, 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 in retrospect, I think they get their stuff. It is we guys who don't get it. We simply go there and say that you guys don't know the value of design. Like we all know this, right? Design never had a seat at the table. Now we yeah, have the table. Yeah. Now in the last five years, we have the table. Forget the seat. <laughs> but have we seen the exponential differences, changes uh, we expect? No, not really. So uh, you don't get good design for nothing. Basically, is because two things, axioms. One is people trivialize design. If you actually deliver the goods uh, for free or almost free, I have literally yeah, yeah, experienced yeah. this myself where uh, people, I mean, some of them have shocked saying, he just did this in three days. I, I, I don't know uh, if that was so complex, you know, because time is what they look at it. And uh, then I realized that, okay, if you don't put a premium uh, to what you do, uh, this is what it, it gets commoditized. And my worry is that design has already been commoditized. And then on top of it, we, we have a lot of other magic happening, right? We, like you, you spoke about co-creation workshops. Uh, I think these are, these are fantastic beautiful tools in our tool set but i think there's a lot of misuse also that happens hmm. then okay any problem you got you want to solve the world hunger problem yeah let's do a three-day workshop and voila <laughs> uh, so i i have <laughs> i'm an anecdotal but yeah unfortunately it happens so it gives yeah, it us yeah. it gives us practitioners a bad name but at the same time i mm-hmm. think uh, the business world also is uh, an audience to all of these anecdotes and i think they they have their own premonitions or they have their own perceptions and, you know, okay, yeah. let's get, get a designer into the room and let's, you know, pay some. So what, what the other thing, the other global phenomena that I've seen is like, you know, hey, there, you know what? Yeah, we know, we know that design is the most important. We have a mandate, we are design led, we are this, we are that, but hey, you know what? Here's five bucks. Please solve my uh, 500 bucks problem. And hey, I'll promise you 5,000 bucks down the lane. Show me, show me. Uh, yeah okay yeah yeah so this is what but, you know that, that that that's what a lot of my uh students used to face when they were kind of first leaving uni was oh, i've got this and they'd write to me or so i talk to me <laughs> so i've got this thing and this guy's saying you know he doesn't have any money now but when he does you know then he's you know i was like you know when you're a, you don't have any money you go and eat you know, pot noodle or in McDonald's. When you've got a lot of money, do you go and eat loads of McDonald's and loads of pot noodles? No, <laughs> you go somewhere else, right? So, yeah. um, you know, that stuff never happens. I, you know, and the thing is that design is very ubiquitous, right? And I think a lot of people f- don't really understand that everything around them has been designed by someone and feel like it just pops into existence. And so sort of, I think the understanding of that is so vague and that's why you know your economist friends are wrong in the sense of that of <laughs> that you know it, it, people don't actually know the value of a lot of things and you know and the value of a lot of things is often extremely emotional there's a a woman who made my wedding ring actually a friend of mine called susan Kahn in australia and she did this whole thing about fakes and real and um she said you know i bet you if i if you had a fake rolex that was given to you by your now deceased father and i had a real rolex and i said oh, i'll swap it with you you wouldn't right? no. because of the, the emotional attachment to that. So, you know, there's a load of things. The perception of value is a really fascinating area. And I think that's the area that we're always in, in design quite often. And that's why it's not quite so quantifiable. And, you know, the people talking about the designers now got a seat at the table, forget that we <laughs> designers also design the table and the seat. Yeah. <laughs> so look, um, we are coming to the end. As you know, the show is named after the uh, Rand Charles Eames film, where they're kind of about the relative size of things in the universe. So th- I always ask at the end, what one small thing in the world either needs to be redesigned or is kind of overlooked and undervalued would have an outsized effect on the universe? Could be the universe, but at least have an outsized <laughs> effect on the world. I think, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think for us, at least we tribesmen and practitioners and wannabe designers, I think... We, while, while, while we have done a reasonably good job at, you know, design-led this, design-led that, and solving 
ball problems and almost borderline wicket problems. I think we need to reflect back and look at our own educational system in terms of design education. Mm. Uh, I I know I'm not the qualified guy because I didn't go to design school, but I think it also qualifies me from the fact that if I how might we types right if I had to do this go back rewind my tape and go back yeah. uh, back in time I I think design education has to change I think yeah I mean it all started with industrial design and we made the tangible you know work and then we we have gone through multiple turns and now at the speed at which things are changing technology is changing people's behavior are changing. so many things are changing there's a there's a significant societal change uh, advertent or inadvertent that's happening but i think i think the way designers are made in in schools i mean designers are taught and <laughs> yes. designers are made i think yeah i think needs we need to reflect back because what used to work maybe in 2010 i i don't think it's going to work in 2020 and 2020 mm. is a fantastic example uh, yeah it's it's a yeah the pandemic is a pandemic but i think if you set out or step outside of the pandemic as a construct and look at things anything can hit you any time are we are we prepared for it no we are we we are looking at it uh, no but you have to reflect back and see how can we change how can we change design education per se because everybody talks about changing the world design led this design led that but you know and and people park some critical things like circular design i mean it's a it's a mm, new name yeah. new name but for me it's like a you know old wine in a new bottle but is my is my design sustainable i mean simple word right yeah. and then I don't think I don't think schools are doing uh, good stuff on that. I think it's still the race is let me get to uh, one of the top ten, top n schools. Let me get good scores. Let me work for Fiat or Design It or one of the other eight top guys. Let me build a portfolio and then we will see what it's it's good. It's not wrong, but I think it's the time is ripe for us to reflect back and maybe you know look at come up with a few how might we to actually rethink design education. Yeah, I quite agree. I mean, I think the. Um it's interesting i mean yeah sustainability is taught quite a lot in design schools now but the bit that's missing actually goes back to the the previous bit of the conversation which is how you actually sell or explain the value of circular design to the businesses and get them to kind of take it up and it's you know it's it's about leading those conversations within organizations and with organizations and those stakeholders is often is a large chunk of the work so i'm sure it's a big chunk of your work and it doesn't actually get taught in design school very much it's quite a hard thing to practice i wonder if that's part of it but that's a very good a very good answer so listen where can people find you online uh on linkedin so I'm, yeah. i'm kind of i'm kind of anti social i don't even have a facebook account <laughs> it's that's so, not a yeah. it's no longer uh, that's no longer a bad thing that's a that's become a good thing it uh, seems uh, <laughs> so i've always been on that side so i think i think people can look me up on linkedin uh, my handle is uh, is not as complex as my name i mean people can go to linkedin and look up for ux first yeah, that's u x f i s t and i think i do have a similar i i have the same handles on insta and uh, twitter but the anecdote is i just went and registered so that i didn't want someone else to hijack and squat on my handles <laughs> okay <laughs> right. but yeah so there's like one the one post from sort of 6 yeah, years yeah, ago yeah. <laughs> so the linkedin okay. link, linkedin is what uh, you know I, i check almost at least once a day so people can find okay. and then yeah I, I will share my email ID and then you know, I'll talk to people. But LinkedIn is where people can find. LinkedIn's where you hang out. Okay, we'll put the link in the show notes. But it's UX first. Udaya, yes. thank you so much for being my guest on Power of Ten. Hey, Andy, it's, it's been a pleasure, and yeah, we'll talk soon. And uh, thanks, thanks for having me here. So, looking forward to all the other wonderful conversations and the other things that we might end up doing. So, cheers. Thanks. Stay safe. As I'm sure you're aware, you've been listening to Power of Ten. My name is Andy Pelain. You can find me at a pelain on Twitter or pelain.com where you can find more episodes and sign up for my newsletter Doctor's Note. If you like the show, please take a moment to give it a rating on iTunes. It really helps others find us. And as always, get in touch if you have any comments, feedback or suggestions for guests. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and see you next time.